Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. I find it absolutely revolting how many people seem to either outright side with Hamas or side with the Palestinian quote-unquote, quote-end-quote cause or draw a moral equivalency between Israel and Hamas. And I always, I wonder how this type of stuff happens. And here to explain it to us today is somebody well-equipped to do so. He is the former chairman of the board and is currently a distinguished fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. He's also the author of numerous articles and books, including The Tyranny of Need, Examining the Code of Self-Sacrifice, and the Alternative of Rational, Non-Predatory Self-Interest. Peter Swartz, welcome to the program. Thank you, Michael. Glad to be here. So to give us some framework before we really get into it, can you define altruism for us? Because a lot of people seem to think that altruism is just being nice to people or you're being kind to strangers, holding doors, that sort of thing. But that's not really the historical meaning of the term, right? No. Altruism is the idea that the supreme virtue in life, the highest um moral action you can take is to sacrifice yourself. Self-sacrifice is supposed to be the ultimate virtue. You know what a sacrifice means? It means giving up, giving up something that's of value to you for the sake of something that isn't. It means placing the demands and needs of others above yourself simply because they are not you. If you care about your own goals and your own happiness, that's selfish, that's wrong, that's immoral according to altruism. What is moral? Being unselfish, disregarding yourself, being willing to surrender that which is beneficial to you, that which is of value to you for the sake of that which is not of value. It is not simply being kind or benevolent to others because that that can often be in your interest, You uh, want to help people who are in some distress through no fault of their own. You want to uh, sometimes uh, donate money to even to charities because they deserve it. They're doing good work. Altruism says give your money and your energy to people who don't deserve it precisely because they don't deserve it, precisely because they're not deserving it constitutes an act of real sacrifice on your part. If you wipe yourself out of existence, in effect, you say, I'm nothing, what I care about doesn't matter, my life, my values, my happiness are not important, all that's important is that I give those up for the sake of somebody else's needs, then you are a paragon of virtue according to altruism. But if you think about it, if you if you really understand this morality, you see what a a a, a perverse system it is, and what a, what a, a a complete perversion of uh, justice and 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 goodness it demands. It, it, it you you couldn't create a more um, indefensible command than the one that says uh, what you want, what you what is in your interest is worthless. All that matters is become a servant to others. Altruism is a demand for servitude. Ultimately, it's impossible to consistently practice because if I just continue to sacrifice myself take losses one right after the other. Ultimately, I die, right? Sure. There's uh, That's simply saying there's no way to practice the irrational consistently. That's certainly true. That's undeniable. The All of these philosophies, altruism and other, many other uh, irrational uh, ideas, know that it can't be practiced consistently, and they count on that. They count on people doing it sometimes and not others, and thereby inculcating guilt on the part of people who think, well, I'm just not good enough. 
And once they've established this guilt on your part, they've got you. You know, you feel compelled to obey their demands. You don't have the intellectual ammunition by which to resist their demands. You simply comply with it sometimes because you think that's the only right thing to do. You don't comply with it other times because you have to have to live your life, but you feel guilty. And that's a, that is how altruism maintains a stranglehold over people who accept it, even though they don't practice it consistently, as no one can practice it consistently. It just sparked in my in my mind just now that I, I talk to people that are good people. And it's that guilt thing that they feel guilty, like they're not doing enough for other people or, or they're not doling out enough of themselves to others. And I, and I have this conversation with them, like, you know, why do you think you owe other people? And ultimately it's because altruism permeates our culture, even though people don't know it, maybe never even heard the term, certainly never heard of August Comp, Comte, but nevertheless, the philosophy and the ethic is embedded in them. And that's exactly what it leads to is guilt. Yes. And, and there's really just one thing that you should tell these people uh, to um, cut this uh, bond of guilt that they have. When they confront the demands of altruism, there's one word that will refute everything. And that word is why. Why is your life unimportant and your neighbor's is? Why is it more important to ignore the things that will make you happy, the things that will achieve your goals, but the things that will achieve the goals or the demands of your neighbor become morally imperative? You earned your money, presumably, if you're an honest person, you're a productive person, you, 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 you make a good living, you earn your money. Why is your earning the money, why does that not entitle you, morally entitle you to it, whereas the fact that your neighbor hasn't earned it, the fact that your neighbor is poor, the fact that your neighbor has needs, that somehow creates a moral claim against you. There's no reason for it. There's no justification for it. No justification has ever been offered for it. And all that people need to do is ask why, but they can't. They can't ask why because we'll get into that if you like. <laughs> we uh, Hopefully we will. Okay, so what sparked me to want to have you back on is I read a, an essay that you posted to Facebook about why people are supporting Hamas or lending credibility to them, sympathizing with them. And you, for, in order to explain it, you told the story of a school teacher. What what did that school teacher say? Well, it's not the story. This is a school teacher in Atlanta who posted on Facebook just a couple of sentences. There was a discussion going on about Israel versus Hamas. And she posted, I have this quote. Here, there's the quote from her. She was a, an ardent supporter. She is an ardent supporter of Hamas. And she was trying to explain her position. And she said, this is a quote from her post. The actual history of this situation is not complicated. I will always stand beside those, beside those with less power, less wealth, less access and resources and choices. Let me repeat that. I will always stand beside those with less power, less wealth, less access and resources and choices. Regardless of the extreme acts of a few militants who were done watching their population slowly die. So her, close quote, her statement is simply, I am supporting Hamas because they are the weaker entity here. Their need is greater. It doesn't matter, and this is a consistent implementation of altruism, it doesn't matter that these Hamas and the Palestinians who support Hamas are engaged in, in brutal acts of, of murder 
and rape and decapitation, it doesn't matter that justice is on the side of Israel requiring them to retaliate and to wipe out this threat, this aggressive threat on their doorstep. Justice does not matter. Israel does have justice on its side, but altruism says you must sacrifice justice to need. The fact that Israel uh, is more deserving of your support is exactly the argument for not providing it. It's exactly the argument for sacrifice your conviction, sacrifice your idea of justice because Hamas is poor and weak and helpless and they need your support. And this is what altruism says across the board. It doesn't matter why somebody is in need. It doesn't matter that he himself is the cause of his misery. If you know students, when they go to college, take out student loans and it helps them uh, get a college education, and then they decide, you know, I, I wish somebody would, would um, take this burden off me. I really don't want to pay this loan back. You are obligated, you, the whole general public, who have, anyone who is a, a taxpayer who has money, is obligated, according to altruism, to satisfy the needs of these students who took out loans and no longer want to pay them. If there's a homeless bum on your street corner and his, his plight is clearly caused by his uh, alcoholism, his drug addiction, his, his, he, he chooses to spend his days in a, in, a, in a stupor, does not try to go out and find a job to support himself. That does not matter according to altruism. All that matters is, is he has needs. You have the means of satisfying those needs. You are morally obligated to help him. You're morally obligated to forego your own interests, your own needs, because he his needs take moral precedence. And that's what's happening with Israel and Hamas. Hamas is a, 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 a bunch of um, thugs. Uh, they don't care about justice and about right or wrong, but they're the weaker party. They're weak because of their their own self inflicted wounds. They're weak because they've elected they 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 the people in 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 the Gaza elected a government that's a, a a a an authoritarian government that doesn't allow them any freedom. Any Arab in Israel has a hundred times greater freedom than any Arab in Gaza. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who is right. It doesn't matter uh, which cause is just. All that matters is who is weaker, who has the greater need. That is the one that has a moral claim on you, according to altruism. So it, th would you say that the two primary components of altruism are need and sacrifice, the need of one party and the sacrifice of another? Yes, the, the idea of sacrifice is what are you sacrificing to? You're sacrificing yourself to someone else's needs. His needs are morally sacrosanct. Yours, because you're able to fulfill them yourself without sacrifice, you've earned the money, you're a productive person, you decided that life requires that you be a self-supporting individual, not be a parasite of others. The fact that you can support yourself means you have no moral consideration. Who does who does get moral consideration? People who choose not to support themselves. People who have who are simply lacking. They lack what you have. You are obligated to sacrifice. So the answer is yes. This hatred for Israel is pretty widespread. I see it through, through Twitter, Facebook, the media. How relatively, how much is explained by just old fashioned anti Semitism, hatred of Jews, and how much by the altruism that you're talking about? No, I think I think there certainly is a growing anti Semitism, but I think the more fundamental explanation is is altruism, uh, because I think even anti Semitism uh, is largely motivated by uh, this this. Uh, envy 
of a group of people who are relatively successful, relatively wealthy. And the altruist says, why do they have all the money? I need it. I, I'm in need. Why do they have, um, you know, positions in finance, in banking, in government, in the arts, in wherever? Why, why do they have it and I don't? I have needs. I have a claim against it. I have a claim on them. So that's in large part what fuels the anti-Semitism, but the, the broader foundation uh, of that opposition to Israel and sympathy for Hamas is that which gives rise to anti-Semitism and many other ideologies, all of which are traceable to the idea that you don't have a moral right to pursue your own goals and your own happiness. You must sacrifice to anyone, anyone who has a need, which means anyone who lacks something that you're able to provide. Now, I don't think that's the whole explanation, by the way. I don't think even altruism is, is not the whole explanation. A large part of it uh, is this growing, unfortunately growing rejection of the idea of objectivity. People are more and more uh, they are more and more feeling entitled to come to certain conclusions without a rational process of looking at evidence, looking at the facts, engaging in logic, coming to some uh, uh, reasonable conclusion. You know, people, for example, uh, all the millions of people who are hold the firm belief that the election was stolen from Trump the last election. They don't care about evidence. They don't care about looking at the facts and examining it. Is it true? Is it not true? Just as Trump himself is the archetype of the person who's oblivious, completely oblivious to facts and to objectivity. All he cares about is, I want something. I want it to be true. I claim it's true, must be true. And this pervades uh, our culture, particularly uh, on campus, on campuses where students are taught philosophically, they're taught reason is a myth, you can't trust your mind, no one can know anything for certain. All that matters is your tribe. If your tribe believes something, you have to believe it. If your tribe is in trouble, you have to support it against the enemy tribe. Uh, it doesn't matter what logic dictates. All that matters is what do the tribal spokesmen demand of you and you have to comply. And that's what's happening <clears throat> excuse me. That's what's happening for a long time with, with Israel and the whole situation with the Palestinians, not just the recent attacks by Hamas but the whole situation where people think Israel somehow is oppressive. Israel somehow is oppressing the Palestinians. Israel somehow has stolen their lands and is occupying it at gunpoint, and these poor people are entitled to their land and they're being denied it by force. Nobody, oh, not nobody, but so many people are just willing to accept that myth and not examine what the facts are, the facts about which, under whose rule are people actually freer? Are they freer under the Israeli rule? or under the rule not just of Hamas, but of virtually any Arab country. Israel has freedoms that no Arab in, in most of those countries, no, no Arab enjoys, including the freedom of religion. You know, Israel allows Muslims to practice their religion. There are mosques in, in, in Israel. There are no synagogues in Gaza. There are no synagogues in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's the, the, Public practice of religions other than Islam is not tolerated there. So, uh, and this myth that this land was somehow expropriated by force, that there was there were people, individuals who owned the property, and Israelis came in by force and told them get out and took that's that's just nonsense. Uh, the the 
when Israel was founded in 1948, the Arab, um, the surrounding Arab governments ordered the people to leave. They didn't want, they, they wanted the people to evacuate the, their, their, their land. Um, other, most of the land that Israel has was, was bought by individuals who, from other individuals who own the property. But the, the, the wider point is that these Arab countries largely don't recognize rights. It, it's bizarre. It's perverse for them to claim, you know, you're violating our rights. You've taken our property, which wasn't true. But they don't believe in rights. They don't believe in, in individual rights, as evidenced by the, the atrocities committed by Hamas, which is supported by most of the, the Palestinians in Gaza and in other Arab countries. You know, what was it now? I think 17 years ago, 15 years ago, let's say, I read an essay that you wrote in the, uh, it was published in the, I think, a Voice of Reason. And it was called Libertarianism as a Perversion of Liberty. Yes. And after reading it, now up to, I had always called myself a libertarian, so did my friend. After reading that essay, my friend told me I'm no longer calling myself a libertarian. You 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 swayed him. You you didn't sway me <laughs> because I said to myself, it seems to me that he's speaking about a specific brand of libertarians. And when I think libertarians, I was thinking Ayn Rand, Ludwig von Mises, Frederick Bastiat. And not until I got out of prison in just in the last year and I started being on Facebook. And I started to see that you could say libertarian and in, in, with a quick definition, say they believe in free, you know, freedom of speech, uh, capitalism, this sort of thing. But after seeing on Facebook and Twitter, the types of things that they post, that they believe in, and I'm not saying it's all libertarians, but it's enough of them. It's enough of them that have energy behind them that draw the moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel that I've stopped calling myself a libertarian. Yes. And, and specifically, I wanted to ask you, why is it that these the anarcho-capitalist wing of the libertarian movement is so quick to draw moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel and really support Hamas? I mean, they don't come out and say that, but it's obvious from the you know what they're saying. Could I address the first part of your statement before I answer your, the second part there? Sure, sure. It, 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 it's it's important to understand this. Now, the, the term libertarian had originally a very positive meaning. It, it referred to people, as you say, the, the free market uh, uh, supporters, basically, people like Henry Hazlitt and Von yes, Mises. Yes. That's what libertarian was. Now it's come to mean something different. And the, the crucial question to ask when you want to know, do I call myself a libertarian or not? It's not a question of counting noses. You know, how many people in the libertarian movement support Israel? How many support Hamas or some other criterion you come up with? What matters is this. Are the people who claim to disagree with the, let's call them bad libertarians, are those people willing to say that if these bad people are libertarians, then I am not? If the term libertarian is going to apply to them, then it's a, a term that can't apply to me. And this is a, a the, the easy test to make with respect to anarchism. I, can't, I always um, accuse libertarians of either being anarchists or being sympathetic to anarchists. And they always come back to me and say, no, I believe in, in government. I believe in limited government. Yes, there are others who don't, but why tar the whole libertarian movement with this label of anarchist? And the answer is because even the supposed non-anarchists regard the anarchists as allies. They regard the anarchists as supporters of capitalism, as allies in the fight for freedom. Now, they would never regard a socialist, an explicit socialist, as an ally, even if you agreed on some concrete. Yet they, they, they are so dismissive of the importance of ideas that they'll regard 
an anarchist as an ally because they say, well, we agree on 95% of the issues. 95% of the things the limited government libertarians and the anarchist libertarians agree that the government should have no role. And it's only 5% that we disagree with. So now this is such a non-philosophical, an anti-philosophical mentality. It's so um, repudiating the whole power of ideas, particularly philosophic ideas, that this is why I say when you li libertarians who call themselves opponents of anarchism are in fact supporters of anarchism if they don't repudiate anarchism entirely. That is, if they don't say anarchists have no place in the libertarian movement. Since they don't say that, it means they regard this as trivial and they are de facto supporters of anarchism. Now, to get back to your second question, why are libertarians, uh, why are so many libertarians uh, sympathetic to Hamas, or why do they regard a moral equivalency between Israel and Hamas? It's a good question. And, and the answer is because they are not motivated by a desire for uh, freedom and individual rights. They are motivated by a hatred of the state. Uh, as I wrote in the book, they're not anti-statism, they're simply anti-state, including the nominal, the people who are nominally not anarchists. They want to destroy, uh, they want to oppose any restrictions on their desires. They say, who is, this, who is the government to tell me what I can and can't do? Who is anybody to, if I feel like doing something, who's the government to tell me not? If I want to walk down the street with a loaded machine gun, who's the government to tell me I can't do it? This is what the libertarian mentality is. And therefore, their real hostility is to the best government. It's to the, to the United States is the object of their antagonism, because that's their, the greatest threat to them. They want to eliminate all government, uh, all government um, um, control over their actions. And here you have people who are supporting the United States and people who say, yes, this is a good, largely, or was, certainly was more in the past, a largely legitimate, justified government. It is primarily pro-freedom, even though it's a mixed economy. And their view is, no, that we've got to get rid of that. You know, Murray Rothbard, who is the, really the father of modern libertarianism, said this explicitly. He wrote, um, I forget in which book of his it was. He said, this was in the um, 50s and 60s, maybe this, even the early 70s, when you had the, the Soviet empire was... Um, occupying was 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 ruling half of Europe, you know, all of, most of Eastern Europe, uh, and was threatening the West all the time with their weapons. He said the most aggressive warmongering country in the world is the United States. And that the Soviet Union is a peace-loving country. So this is the mentality that arises from start when you start from a premise that the state is bad, no one should have any um, say in what I do or what I want in what I in how I act. If you start from that premise rather than from the premise of individual rights, you end up by saying America is a threat to the world and the Soviet Union is a peace loving nation. And that is what applies today. This Hostility to Israel, again, it's partly anti-Semitism, but it's much wider because it's it's also hostility to the United States. There's a um, strong sentiment of anti-Americanism running through libertarianism, and that extends not just to America, but to Israel and other Western countries that are on the same axis as the United States. 
So they're happy to say all governments are bad. There's a moral equivalence between Israel and and um, and and Hamas or other Arab countries. Just as Maury Rothbard said, there's a moral equivalence between America and the Soviet Union. Even though he would say America is even worse than the Soviet Union. That's the source of this moral equivalence and sympathy for Hamas. Well, well said. <laughs> that was fantastic. Okay, beyond Israel and Hamas, you already gave two great examples of altruism in in the United States in relation to Donald Trump and in relation to what's going on on the college campuses, which demonstrates that it's it's a phenomenon that's both on the left and the right. It's not unique to either side. Or it wasn't, I'm sorry, it wasn't altruism. You said it was the the irrationality, the subjectivism, that's what you were referring to. But what, how else does altruism manifest itself in American culture and in American politics? Well, in American politics, altruism is the basis for all government involvement in people's lives, involvement that doesn't belong there. The whole welfare state, for example, is based on the fact that there are some people in need and there are other people who have the means of satisfying those needs. So people need, um, people don't have health insurance. Some people don't have health insurance. Other people have to provide it. Some people don't have uh, enough money, supposedly, for food. You have to give them food stamps, which are provided by those people who uh, have the means to do so. The whole welfare state is, is based on that. The whole regulatory state is based on that. The regulatory state, which says, for example, you cannot decide on your own which medicine to take. You can't go to your doctor and say, look, I've got this illness. Can I take this medicine? It has risks. It has benefits. Are the risks, are the benefits worth the risk? You can't do that. The FDA, a government regulatory agency, has to decide that for you. The FDA has to tell you, you are not capable of deciding what's best for you. Uh, only a disinterested third party, i.e. the government, can decide these things. Altruism rests on the view that the individual is, is, is incompetent, is helpless, the individual is dependent upon society for his survival. That's the metaphysics of altruism. That's its view of human nature. And therefore, according to altruism, we can't leave people uh, on their own. If you, if you just leave people to their own devices, they'll be hungry and starving in the streets. So we've got to provide a welfare state to feed them. If you leave people alone to make decisions about what medicines to buy, what cars to buy, what kind of houses they, they, they should buy. They're going to end up harming themselves. They don't know what medicine is good for them. They don't know what kind of, what car is good for them. We have to tell you got, the car has to have so many miles per gallon and it's got to have so many features, etc. We can't rely on people freely choosing for themselves. And that's the whole um, foundation of altruism. And it manifests itself in all, virtually all the activities that government is involved in that it shouldn't be. Those are uh, expressions and products of altruism. And, if, if, and then besides politics, obviously altruism uh, infects people's personal lives. As you mentioned, Michael, you said you talk to people who feel guilty because they don't do enough. There's this homeless bum on the street. They don't help them out enough. There are people in need. Uh, they have three, th these people uh, who are well off, who earned their money, presumably they haven't stolen it. They've earned it honestly. They feel guilty because they have three square meals and they've got a car in the garage and they've got a nice house, maybe with a swimming pool. And there are people who don't have it. There are people who have to live in smaller houses who don't can't afford a car, can't afford a pool, can't afford... Uh, the nice clothing that they have. They feel guilty for that. And this is what enables the government to then 
um, uh, demand from them that they support all the schemes of the welfare state, which are designed to take from the haves and give to the have-nots, which means take from people who have earned uh, their wealth and give to the people who simply lack it uh, and, and demand that you provide for them. Earlier, you said that the way to cut through that is one word. Why? Yes. I interviewed uh, a senior editor from Mother Jones magazine, a big leftist uh, organization. And it was, with the interview was about intergenerational wealth, which he was critiquing. Now, he got most of his facts wrong as far as how much money is inherited and all that. But what I did was he kept throwing the word the words like should around. They should this, people should that. And I asked him, I said, okay, well, you keep saying, making these moral claims. And he said, yes. I said, okay, tell me this. By what standard are you arriving at that judgment? Which is just a long way of asking why. And he was completely dumbfounded. He had no answer for the question. Yes. And I, 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 it amazes me how simple that is with, with what you said, that when you ask why, nobody's ever given me an answer. I mean, I, mean, I, I suppose some religionist might have said, well, the Bible says so, or the Quran says so, or something, but no rational answer. Yeah, you but, just ask, why should you listen to the Bible? Yeah, you exactly. No to that. So, uh, go ahead. but but I, why is enough to dismantle altruism? But then there's a vacuum. How, without, I mean, we can't get everybody to go out and read Atlas Shrugged or study the objectivist ethics in, in detail. Some people, you know, they might not have the time, they're raising families. But how do we get people or... I don't know if gets the right word. How do we communicate to people that it's right to live for yourself? It's right to be selfish in the sense of taking care of yourself, your family, being happy. The reason people have no real answer to the question of why is that is they take as self-evident the fact that if you want to be moral, if you want to do what's right, you have to be an altruist. You have to sacrifice yourself for others. They take that as self-evident because of this terrible package deal that we're all taught, that the only conceivable alternative, which is selfishness, means that you go around um, stomping on other people uh, being a parasite off them, demanding that they sacrifice for you. So the choice that people have is only either you, you become like Mother Teresa and you sacrifice everything in order to help others, or you become like a criminal, you become a till of the hunt. Uh, you, 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 you exploit people, you rob from people, you kill people. They can't imagine a genuine alternative of no sacrifice, of neither sacrificing yourself to others nor sacrificing others to yourself, which means living a, a productive, honest life where you earn what you get. You earn the values that you have. You produce the wealth that your life depends on. And when you deal with other people, it's not by force. It's not by fraud. You don't put a gun to their head. Rather, you deal with them by exchanging value for value. You say, I produce this, you produce that, let's trade. Let me buy this from you or let me you sell this to me. That is mutual cooperation by means of trade. And trade is the opposite of sacrifice. Trade is a transaction where both parties benefit, as against sacrifice, where one person's supposed benefit can come only at the expense of another person's loss. Nobody has told people before objectivism, really, nobody has told people that the alternative of selfishness does not mean living a life as a mindless brute, uh, uh, feeding off other people, 
they think it's either or. And the answer to the question of what, how to explain to people uh, that there's an alternative to altruism is to exactly that. Tell them there is an alternative which you are not aware of. The alternative is selfishness, rational selfishness, not this mindless hedonism, not Donald Trump, not Attila the <laughs> Hun, not the life of a playboy, not the life of a criminal, not the life of a drug addict, but the life of a self-respecting, self-supporting, productive individual. You know, it, it's kind of off topic, but it's kind of not. When you mentioned Donald Trump, it absolutely flabbergasts me how many people I come across on the internet that say that Donald Trump is an Ayn Rand hero. <laughs> that, that, that there, there's one guy told me there's no doubt in my mind Ayn Rand would have supported Donald Trump. And it, I, I, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't even know how to assess that. I guarantee you, Ayn Rand, the, the only choice where she would vote for Bernie Sanders <laughs> and about socialists over Donald Trump. I guarantee that. <laughs> You know, I, I think you're right, because I think she would say at least he has a consistent system or a consistent belief that no, he no, really not, believes it's, in. It's not just that, but it's clear what he thinks. It's clear that he's an yeah. enemy of capitalism and you're still free to oppose him and say he's a socialist. Here's why socialism is wrong. As against the people who pretend to be your ally. This is the reason why she was so adamantly opposed to the religious right, even though they claim to be supporters of capitalism, uh, she said there, there's much greater danger to capitalism from its alleged friends like the religious right who want to nominally support it, but uh, entirely on the wrong foundation. There are much greater threat to capitalism than the avowed liberals. Uh, and, and the same for libertarians. They claim to be for capitalism, but they're a worse threat than the clear cut left. Uh, and the same applies to Trump. Trump is, is a, to the extent he's anything, he, ha he has no ideology he stands for. He's a, a, a mindless brute. He has no conception of morality. He has no conception of truth and falsehood. He, he lives for polls that show the public supports him. His existence uh, is, is um, validated in his mind by the number of votes that he gets and the, the number of cheers that he gets. That's why he loves to go to these political rallies and give speeches and get, get applause. Uh, he is the antithesis of, of, an, object, of, of an Ayn Rand hero. He's, he's, the, he's the epitome of mindlessness complete mindlessness. Uh, and it's a shame that people, you know, are somehow confused by him. Uh, I agree. Before I let you go, is there anything that you think we didn't cover in relation to well, altruism? Sure. Here's one thing. You know, we're talking about altruism and we're talking about what people need to be told. Here's the book. Um, let's see. Can people see that? The Tyranny of Need? Is that yes. coming across? So that's, that's a book. The Tyranny of Need is exactly what altruism is it's it's a it's a form of servitude it's a form of demanding that you become the slave uh the 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 rightless slave of your neighbor or anybody who says i have a lack you can you can satisfy it you have a moral obligation to do it so they want that book the book is available in a lot of places they want to go to my website. It's peterschwartz.com. Uh, I have a whole list of this book and my other writings and lectures that people are interested in. I was just on the website and I'm going to order that book tonight, The Tyranny of Need. I said, I looked it up. It's on Amazon. I get it on Kindle. I can read it right on my phone. I plan on Be doing guess. it tonight. Be my well, guest. Good for you. Thank you so much for joining us again. You are a wealth of wisdom, sir. And uh, thank you for not only for coming on, but for all you've done throughout the years, right? Writing for objectivism. Tr truly, it's an honor to speak with you.
Thank you. This is, I enjoyed this. You're a good interviewer. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Remember, let me know what you think. It's very important. Till next time.